Then the disappearances started happening in Utah. So now Utah is in a state of hysteria the way Seattle was when Ted was living in Seattle. The authorities from Utah called us. They had read about the disappearances in the Seattle region. We told them about Ted Bundy. And then they checked and found out that he was there. The problem was they didn't have any evidence to connect him to those murders. So we weren't able to arrest him for those crimes. And he was free to go anywhere. While he was in Utah, he would make side trips to Colorado. There were three women, I believe, total, but most likely a lot more. In the beginning of Ted's adventure of discussing behavior, there was a certain pattern to it where he would pretend to need help and he would charm a lot of these women. But later on, he became increasingly violent. I think it began with the Durange kidnapping in Utah. Carol Durange was at the largest shopping mall in Salt Lake City, and this person came up claiming to be a police officer, identifying himself as Officer Rosebud, and said, somebody's tampering with your car, come with me. She ends up getting into a Volkswagen bug that's all beat up, and then he tries to handcuff her, and hit her with a crowbar. So Carol flew out of the Volkswagen into the lap of the people who were driving the car next to Ted. She miraculously escapes. About a year after her attempted kidnapping, this police officer just happened to drive down this cul-de-sac in Utah and saw this Volkswagen bug at 3 o'clock in the morning idling in front of a house. And he knew that the adults in that house were gone and had left the children there, which were younger women. And so he chased the bug until Ted pulled over. And then he got out and just classic Ted and said, well, I'm just kind of lost. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. They eventually search the car and find ice picks, pantyhose with eye holes cut in them, handcuffs, a bunch of different license plates for different states. You know, a lot of things that are very difficult to explain. And that's how they caught Ted. In October of 75, Ted Bundy was identified in a police lineup after being arrested on kidnapping charges in Salt Lake City. Once he was arrested in Utah, the newspapers in Washington State and all across the country went crazy. It was a frenzy everywhere. Then he was released on bail in Utah, which I thought was a very low bail. I think it was $150,000, of which they only have to put up 10%. But I think the reason for that was they wanted to get more evidence against him in Washington. The moment he was released on bail, Ted went back to Seattle, and the Washington authorities followed him around to hopefully build a case. We were worried when he was in Seattle that he would do it again. This guy is totally consumed with murder 24 hours a day. That is when the TED Task Force went into full operation with five or six detectives, steadfastly following him around, even to the point of letting him know that we were there. He wasn't officially charged with anything in Washington state. He was being heavily investigated, and that's why he had a right to counsel, because in Washington and most other places, you have a right to counsel even before you're charged. Ted had talked to other lawyers and law students, and came up with my name. I was a brand new lawyer in King County Superior Court in Seattle, and I thought Sean Henry Brown was the best lawyer I had ever seen. He had the voice, he had the stature, he had the theater. He had every aspect you need to be the consummate trial lawyer and defender, you know, the dam, which he is. Ted knew who John was, and that's the lawyer he wanted. He picked the best. I first met Ted in the lobby of the public defender's office. Ted came in the back door from the alley. He was, you know, jovial and trying to be charismatic. He didn't appear to be scared. I didn't know it at the time, but evil just entered my life, pure evil. 